In some of the other houses we're now trialling, we won't have radiators. We'll either have skirting board heating or underfloor heating. It's a multifunctional skirting board. Yeah. From 2025, new build housing stock will need to be built with low flow temperature heating systems, most probably in the form of air source heat pumps. Even if it's not heat pumps and boilers go absolutely nowhere, from June this year, 2023, all new heating system designs will need to be at lower flow temperatures. And that means they have to be 55 degrees C or below. Lower designed flow temperatures mean that if developers want to stick with their existing scope of heat emitters, they're faced with either having to use underfloor heating or oversized radiators. The average correction factor for a radiator when moving from a boiler to a heat pump is 0.35 which means that radiators will likely have to be more than two and a half times their current size. This creates a number of practical challenges when building large scale developments. Some of the practical challenges associated with installing underfloor heating include the following. One, program implications. Practical completion can take between three and six weeks longer with underfloor heating. And that's because you need to leave the screed to dry and you can't overlap trays once that pipe work's been installed. Two, risk. There's always a small risk of somebody getting it wrong and putting a screw or a nail through the floor, which can result in a huge disaster that takes weeks to rectify. Meanwhile, everybody on site is pointing the finger at each other and ultimately that results in cost for the developer. Three, construction methodology. Underfloor heating works best with screeded flooring systems. And that means that A, you need to allow suitable time in the program for that screed to be installed and dried. B, you can't use screedless construction methodologies. And C, the problem for what to do upstairs is still not been resolved. Four, floor coverings. The heating system's performance is defined by the floor covering system which is installed over the top of it. Meaning that the system will work perfectly with tiles, but were that customer to then install a high tog carpet, it may compromise the performance during the winter months. Developers need to stipulate to their residents which floor covering systems can and can't be used with underfloor heating once the property has been purchased. And finally, manifolds. Number five, manifolds are a necessity for underfloor heating system because all the pipe work needs to plumb back to one central location that has the pump, the wiring center and the mixing valves. Space needs to be found for this manifold and if there's one thing that we know about many new build developments is that space and covered space is an absolute premium. By using manifolds the whole plumbing installation becomes marginally more complicated and ultimately that leads to an increase in cost and detriment to the overall program. Were a developer to stick with standard radiators those radiators would likely need to be significantly bigger than the ones that have currently been designed on a gas boiler. And this also presents a number of practical challenges. Primarily, number one is space. Many new build houses have very little wall space to begin with, and by increasing the size of the radiator by two or three times, that space has then been compromised even further, meaning that radiators have become significantly more obstructive and significantly more noticeable. And that brings me on to number two, which is aesthetic. I mean, just look at them. Three is the first fix plumbing. On a heat pump, radiators need 15 millimeter pipe work in order to get the correct delivery of water at lower flow temperatures. Currently on a standard boiler setup, radiators are plumbed in 10 millimeter pipes, which drop down the wall and emerge from the back of the radiator in a little back box. The exact positioning of these 10 millimeter pipes is not critical because if they're slightly over to the left, or slightly over to the right, a bit too high or a bit too low, they're gonna be hidden behind the radiator anyway. Even if one pipe is significantly longer than the other, the plumber can make good on site once the radiators are installed. However, when plumbing in 15 millimeter pipe work, every single radiator position is critical because in each room, the radiators are different sizes, which means that the pipe work needs to be brought out of the wall or out of the floor at different widths. It also needs to emerge from the wall at the right height. If it's coming from the floor, it needs to emerge from the floor at the right depth from the wall. So plumbing for these radiators in 15 mil has now gone back to the old way of doing it, which is significantly more complicated than it has been for the last 20 years. 
If a plumber messes up this pipe work at first fix stage and doesn't realise until they come to install the radiators, you've got a major job on your hands to correct that pipe work. You'll likely have to cut out floors or cut out walls in order to readjust the positioning because without doubt, one of the things that will show up on the snags is that pipe work is bending into radiator valves. Four. Feed positions. More often than not, radiators are positioned at the very extremities of the building, on external walls, underneath windows. And that means that the pipe work for those radiators needs to extend right the way to the edge of every single room. It's more pipe, it's more insulation, and it's more labor. It can also lead to a more convoluted plumbing design and create clash elements with other mechanical and electrical equipment. Finally, oversized radiators are often way bigger than people realise, and they need patricing or structural support built into the wall in order to take their weight. A radiator for a lounge, for example, could weigh in excess of 20 kilograms, meaning that it is a two-man job just to carry it into the building. Once it's full of water, it could weigh more than 40 kilograms, meaning that four 5 mil screws are just not gonna be man enough to hold it to the wall. Developers need to consider a safe anchoring method to hold radiators of this size in place without the risk of them coming off. Many developers who are currently using heat pumps or low temperature systems are coming up against a number of usability and educational challenges once residents move in. People are used to seeing radiators in their house and they're used to feeling them absolutely bouncing hot. When they're on a heat pump, they have to get used to the fact that their radiators are now gonna be warm to the touch or lukewarm to the touch. And often this leads to people complaining that the heating system isn't working effectively just because they're touching the radiator. When radiators are used on a heat pump, people People often try and use their heating system just like they're used to on a boiler, turning it up, turning it down, turning it on when they get home from work, turning it off when they leave, and this absolutely kills the COP of the heat pump. And then residents are stood around scratching their head wondering why it's costing them a fortune to run. So if a radiator has got even 10 or 20% of its volume filled with air, the performance of that system drops right off a cliff, and often with a boiler, the output, the delta T, is high enough for it to be able to take it. With a heat pump, it's designed to quite critical performance factors, which means you're gonna to have to ensure that all of the air is kept out of the system. In addition to this, 80% of all maintenance call-outs to new heating systems are for air in the system. And that's one of the primary reasons that radiators are being pushed aside on high maintenance contracts like social housing. Radiators also introduce the problem of people drying their clothes on them. This can cause several problems. On a boiler, you can get away with it because the delta T is really high. So if you put clothes on a 70 degree radiator, more often than not, it can dry the clothes and heat the room at the same time. On a heat pump, however, if you put a towel or wet clothes over the top of your radiator, you will kill the performance of that radiator. As a result, the heating system will cease to work effectively. And so drying clothes and heating your home becomes a binary decision. In addition, with houses being so airtight nowadays, you really do not want to be promoting people drying clothes on radiators. It creates a high amount of moisture in the air, which leads to condensation, mold, and damp. So when it comes to skirting board heating, I like to break down the practicalities and the possibilities for low temperature heating systems into four key areas. One, the design benefits. Two, the on-site or production benefits. Three, the overall energy performance benefits, and for the sort of practical usability end user type benefits. Design benefits. Discrete Heat offer a full design service. That includes heat pumps, boilers, cylinders, pipe work, controls, and of course the necessary skirting board heating to hit the design loads. We also provide a schedule of losses and a full indemnity guarantee meaning that developers can use our design service for their renewable package with no risk whatsoever. Developers get full freedom of their room back. They don't need to find somewhere to fit a huge radiator. They can have full flexibility of the overall room layout, meaning that furniture can go pretty much anywhere. Overall, the rooms that they're selling look bigger. And of course, they only have to make one plumbing connection per room. Dimensionally, the thermoskirt is the exact same as a standard skirting board. It's only 20 millimeters thick, which means that the overall aesthetic of the rooms is massively improved. And often people can't necessarily put their finger on it, but they walk into a space and it feels bigger, it looks bigger, and it looks better. 
From an interior design and sales perspective, houses without radiators have a much greater curb appeal. These properties tend to be more appealing to house buyers who not only care about energy performance, but they also care about the overall practicality and aesthetic of the property. One of the main on-site plumbing benefits of skirting board heating is that all the plumbing connections are hidden behind the skirting board itself. That means that you've got a universal connection detail, no matter how big the room, which profile is selected, or what the overall heat output is needed. It's a one size fits all detail, which means that plumbing consistency on site is safe and secure, and you're not gonna run into snags of people putting pipework in the wrong place or too far apart from one another. These plumbing connections can then meet the skirting at the most practical place for you as the developer. So rather than the radiator dictating where you need to get the pipework to, you can decide where's the easiest place to put the first fixed plumbing, and then start the skirting from there. This can often keep pipe work runs to a central core of the property and avoid the need to run it out to the extremities. The pipe work is often the exact same as a radiator, so you could use 22 millimeter plastic pipe work that's branched off from 15 millimeter plastic pipe work, and that 15 millimeter connects to the skirting at each of the predetermined locations. We often provide the skirting board heating in pre-cut kits. That eliminates waste, it speeds up the installation, and it gives you a pre-prescribed bill of materials for each of the room types, so that the installers know exactly what needs to go into each room. This not only speeds up the installation of the overall heating system, but it also eliminates the need for a joiner to fit skirting and a decorator to fill and paint skirting. In the Barrett's house, E-Home 2, we installed a full three bedroom house in less than nine and a half hours. And that included the skirting, the installation and commissioning, and of course, all the finishing detail to complete the system. Available in a two pipe or a three pipe system, only two profiles need to be stocked by a distribution center. So instead of having to stock a large range of radiator sizes for all the different rooms, you just have a very, very simple bill of materials. And not only does that simplify the supply chain, it also provides significant scalability. From a performance perspective, skirting board heating creates an all round even heat distribution in the form of radiant heat. And this means that heat pumps are far more likely to succeed because you've got that comfort level regardless of the overall flow temperature. At lower flow temperatures, radiators often struggle to create the convection currents needed to transfer the heat evenly around the room. And that can be seen from the Bizria test data that's published on our website. As the profile is made out of aluminium, it's incredibly responsive, which means that the whole system starts working immediately once the heating system starts to heat up. This means that it's a lot more practical to use from a usability standpoint, and you don't have to wait for hours for your room to reach temperature. Infrared heat has been proven to create the highest level of thermal comfort, regardless of temperature. By putting your heat emitter on the external walls, you're creating a thermal envelope which prevents heat from being lost through those walls by combating it where the heat losses are most present. This includes areas like floor to ceiling windows, patio doors, or bifolding doors. From a practicality perspective, there's a number of things which I'll fire through as quick as I can. One is it's a horizontal pipe, so there's nowhere for air to collect. This means that the system doesn't need to be bled like a radiator, and once it's been fitted and commissioned, it is completely fit and forget. Aluminium profile used with plastic first fix plumbing introduces no ferrous metals to a system. That means that over time, the central heating system won't degrade and it won't sludge up, meaning that you won't necessarily need to power flush the system in 20 years time, and your Magna Clean or TF1 inline filter is probably gonna need a lot less cleaning out than it would with a radiator. Of course, it also designs out the ability to dry your clothes on a radiator, which means that just by virtue of the fact it's not available, you as the developer eliminate the likelihood that damp, mold, and condensation can be promoted through the drying of clothes on a heating system. As Thermoskirt is not a radiator, users tend not to need to use it like a radiator or tend not to try and use it like a radiator. That means that when they touch it and they feel that it's warm, they accept the fact that it doesn't need to be as hot as a standard radiator. They've not got preconceived ideas around how the heating system should work, which means they often just let it do its thing and work to the design that we've put together. This ensures that correct performance is achieved and the heat pump runs as it's intended 
And overall, that's good for everybody because heat pumps or low temperature systems aren't then complained about in the Daily Mail when people say that the rooms aren't warm enough. So who's using it right now? Well, two of the biggest developers are currently piloting thermoskirt systems. One is Barrett, who initially used thermoskirt in combination with a Mitsubishi EcoDam on their Z House program. The Z House was intended to test radiators, underfloor heating and thermoskirt all on a heat pump to not only evaluate the practical usability but also the performance characteristics of the overall heating system. From there, Barrett's then went into Energy House 2 with their eHome 2 development. With eHome 2, this is running off a Valent R290 heat pump exclusively with thermoskirt. No other heat emitters are in there running off the air source heat pump other than a small radiator in the hallway. The eHome 2 is Barrett's push towards a net zero future and it's gonna set out what their future home standard properties look like. If you wanna find out how we got on in Barrett's eHome 2 project, then you can click the video here. So if you're a housing developer who's struggling to find a practical way to heat your properties at low flow temperatures, then you can lean on us. Send us your plot types and the floor plans and our in-house design team will put together a full and detailed design proposal absolutely free.